Welcome, friends. This is a ninth lecture. We started uh, our lecture from Mr. Biswajit Bhattacharya, senior advocate, on the topic of uh, Union Budget 2018. Thereafter, Mr. Romi Chaku, Mr. Triprari Rai, Mr. S. B. Upadhyay, senior advocate, Mr. P. B. Suresh, Ms. Kumadlata Das, Dr. K. B. S. Rajan, and last one, uh, Mr. K. Vinayagam, senior advocate. Today, we have gathered uh, to hear Mr. Anand Prasad is the co-founder of uh, number two company in our country, Tri-Legal, and uh, the topic is mergers and ac acquisition. Before uh, we, I invite him, I request my uh, joint secretary, Mr. Rahul Kaushik, to present a bouquet to Mr. Anand Prasad and felicitate him. I request Mr. Shakil Ahmed, member executive, to present another bouquet. Mr. Piyush Kanti Roy, our joint treasurer, may also welcome him. Mr. Minesh Tube, our treasurer, to welcome Mr. Anand Prasad. And uh, Mr. Rajiv Tyagi, uh, old friend of Mr. Anand Prasad. And uh, I request Mr. Jan Kanlyan, the <laughs> our senior advocate, member executive. Since uh, it's a short lecture, so I request Mr. Anand Prasad to kindly uh, come and address the gathering. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think it's a pleasant surprise to see so many of you here. Last day of court. Typically, if I was a regular in court, I would be headed to the airport or to the railway station or something like that. But glad you, you found the time to, to make it to this uh, discussion. Um, when, when Vikrant actually asked me whether I would be interested in doing this lecture, the thought to, in my mind was, I actually, many, many years back, 1991 to 96, I used to be a litigating lawyer. I was very much like yourselves. I used to be a regular in the Supreme Court. I worked uh, at the chambers of Dr. Ghatate and then at Gagrat and Company with, uh, with, with my friend Rajiv. Um, and I understood the practice of law in a certain particular fashion. When I became a corporate lawyer, uh, I also realized that the practice of corporate law is very, very different from, from what I did previously. And so when I, when I came to, to address this lecture, the thought was how do I actually present myself because if I start talking like a regular corporate lawyer, it will sound like Greek and uh, that was not really my intent. So the idea was how do I simplify this? And I thought the best way to do it might be actually to explain it somewhat in the context of my journey of transitioning from being a, a litigator or a disputes lawyer or a constitutional lawyer to being a corporate lawyer. Um, so 96 and, and essentially how, how that movement happened is uh, 91 to 96 and I think three years, 93, 96, I was very hardcore in terms of uh, dispute corporate lawyering. Uh, so did a lot of CLB work, did a lot of high court work, did a lot of Supreme Court work. And in those days, there weren't as many mergers and acquisitions that happened in India, in the Indian space. Uh, the little bit, did, uh, little bit that we did uh, as, uh, as lawyers in Gagrat and Company was more in terms of company mergers. And mergers is the, you have two companies, you sort of merge the two or join the two as a single entity. So as from two entities, they become one. Um, we did certain aspects of what you call a business transfer or, or, or the term used in law is slump sale. I don't know how many of you understand it fully, but it, it actually means if there's a business, you buy it as a going concern. So putting, making it simple, let's say if you buy a restaurant, and if you just take over the restaurant and it is still operating as a restaurant, that is actually buying the restaurant as a going concern. When you give a consolidated price for the, for the restaurant, it is called a slump price. So it is a consolidated price. It includes price for everything, for price for the workers, price for the, uh, the inventory that is there, price for the brand and the trademark. So that is just 
a slum price, it's a consolidated price. And essentially in those days, our focus was, as a lawyer, my focus was actually to deal with the legalese, to the legal issues. So I would look at section so and so, section so and so, and this is what is applicable, and we'd be very focused on those sections. What I realized when I moved to the corporate transactional side is that life actually changed significantly because the initial one year was a big struggle for me. I had to get out of thinking of things purely in legal terms and I had to start thinking more in terms of like a business person. So like an MBA or an investment banker, you had to start thinking in those terms. So the law was in the background. What you were actually trying to do was to actually do a business. And so therefore the need and many of us are not trained in business. We are trained in law. When you go to college, we learn section so and so, constitution of India, etc. But we don't actually, we don't understand how a business operates. Uh, we don't understand financials of a business. We don't understand how can you look at today's revenues and make a projection that for the next five years, this business will make this kind of profit. So that was the sort of mix that I walked into and that was the learning curve that I had to subject myself to. I think it took me it took me a year to make myself presentable to clients. I mean to make clients believe that I actually knew everything when I did not know everything. Uh, but it took me another four years, so I would say about four or five years in all, to understand how everything worked because I actually had no formal training either in finance or in accounting or in commerce. I had no MBA degree, I had just a LLB degree. And that's how I sort of got in. My first run in with, with corporate lawyering uh, was, and those were the early days, 96, India just liberalized. There were small acquisitions that were going on. No significant or no very large acquisition had happened at that time. Um, my first few encounters were with an uh, idea called due diligence. And actually, as a litigator, I had not even heard the term. Somebody said, you need to go for a due diligence. I didn't actually know what a due diligence meant. So I went around running around asking people, what is a due diligence? Um, when, when I was given documents to look at, I would actually read, so if it was a share purchase agreement, I would look at the English, and I would look at the arbitration clause, I would look at the dispute resolution clause, and I would look at whether some parts were enforceable or not. And that, I believed, was my role as a lawyer because the commercials were really meant for the commercial guys. Those were not meant for me to do or not for me to get involved with. Those were the decisions that the client had to take. That was essentially the approach uh, that, that I went to. Um, and slowly did I realize that I had to actually transform from looking from saying that commercials belong to the realm of the business people or the MBAs or the investment bankers uh, or the client, it suddenly had to be my understanding that supplemented the client's understanding. So I actually needed to understand the business and the law was in the background. I just needed to make sure that whatever business I did was actually done legally. And if there was some law standing in the way, like most good structuring lawyers, how do you actually figure out a way to do it around the law without breaking the law? And that is where most commercial lawyers approach uh, anything that they do, is they think commercially, and they think, it, think of what they're doing in a legal context, and they apply it. So that's sort of just my transition as a lawyer from being a, from being a litigator to a commercial lawyer. Now, in commercial lawyering, there are many different kinds of commercial lawyering. You can be a finance lawyer, you can be a project finance lawyer, you can be a capital markets lawyer, you can be an M&A lawyer, you can be a corporate advisory lawyer. So there are many, many different kinds of commercial lawyering. Uh, what I did realize, and interestingly, um, is that in different parts of the world, corporate lawyering was practiced very differently. Many lawyers never ever had gone to partners in big firms and never even gone to a court. Uh, in fact, in England, a uh, lot of the partners actually did not even have a law degree. They were just uh, bachelors in arts or commerce or something like that. They just passed the solicitor's exam and they became lawyers. So there was not even formal training. And then the question, how do they actually function as lawyers? So they were not, in a sense, they were functioning more commercially with a legal sort of framework in their mind, but it was actually commercial functioning. 
coming specifically to M&A, which is the topic uh, over here, and I was just speaking with Mr. Panjwani, he said that you let us start with explaining what is merger and what is acquisition, because it will go on top of everybody's head if you start talking as if you are talking to a commercial audience. Um, so let me describe it as, and the example that I took, and maybe I should revert back to this example, is buying of a restaurant is, is probably, all of us know how restaurants work, we all have gone to restaurants, so if you were to buy a restaurant, as a going concern, so it's actually an operating restaurant, even its brand, its name doesn't change, you just take over. So as a customer, you, don't, you have no realization that the ownership has changed. You just go to the restaurant, it's continuing to operate as it was yesterday, as it is today. And that typically is what happens in an acquisition. So acquisition is a more sophisticated term for just saying buying. So it's, it's just buying something. Now when you buy something, um, and when you talk in terms of, I was talking about a restaurant, but let's say there's a chain of restaurants. So there are many restaurants, there's a Pizza Hut, uh, or there's a McDonald's, and it's got, it's a chain of restaurants. A chain of, a single restaurant is a business, but a chain of restaurants is a very large business. And so therefore, how do you look to buy a large business? If you think in terms of a large business, um, there are various ways that you can buy it. So three basic ways in which you can buy a business is one, you can buy the company that owns the business, that owns the brand. So you can just buy it shares. If you buy the shares of the company, you actually buy the business itself. That is purchase or acquisition through share purchase. You could have another kind of buying of a business where you actually do not buy the company, but you buy the business as it is operating. So, which is what I was describing earlier, it, it, it is a slump sale, so you actually buy the assets. So, including employee contracts, including vendor contracts, everything is just assigned to you as a purchaser. The books move, the bank accounts move, the cash moves, the liabilities move, so everything moves as a going concern. So, the company, so if I were to buy say McDonald's business, McDonald's would still continue as a company, but it would actually have sold all its business, say in Delhi, to me. It may not be in all in India, but say the Delhi business is sold to, sold to me. So the company will continue to operate, it will have businesses in the rest of India, but the India business would have been taken over. So it's not by buying the shares of the company, but it is by buying the assets of the company that I actually buy the business. And so that is called, uh, I mean, the Indian term is slump sale, but very often in the international sense called an asset sale or a business transfer. And the third, and so these are, these are two instances where you're talking just in terms of acquisition. So these are just buys. The question is always, why do you call it mergers and acquisitions? Where is the merger element? Because these are just buying. So where is the merger element? And the merger element comes in, and they are not very common in the Indian context, but the merger element comes in, is that if I want to buy a restaurant chain business in, say, Delhi, take, going with the same example, and I have, I also have a restaurant business in Delhi, so it's a similar business, so it, either a restaurant business or some sort of uh, takeaway business or some, something associated with, with the restaurant business. And I want to buy the Delhi business from McDonald's. The two ways for me to buy are, are the asset sale. I could also buy it in terms of a merger. So I take that business in Delhi, I go to a court, do a demerger come merger scheme, and I fold this business into my business. And when I fold it into my business, I could give McDonald's either cash or I could give them a combination of some cash and some shares in my company or I could just give them shares in my company. So a merger typically comes about where you want to buy a business and you want to actually merge two different companies and make them one. And the reason why you actually do a merger and not do a normal share purchase or an asset purchase is very often uh, very often that you actually want to, one, integrate the businesses and there are various commercial reasons why you might actually also want to do it. The one other big reason, as I said, is if you don't want to just give cash and you want to give shares, either fully or in part. 
That's the reason why you do a merger. In a merger, what also happens is I the big tax benefits, and there are a few tax benefits when you do a merger, uh, is that the losses that I acquire from the company that I buy, if I merge it and mine is a profit-making company, then actually my profitability, my profits go down, and therefore my my need to pay tax on the revenue that otherwise I would have had the profit that I would have had has gone down. So it sort of works as a set off, and they are other than that, that's just very easy and a simple way to describe what the tax benefit might be. But there are actually various ways uh, that you can derive tax benefits. They are sort of indirect tax benefits and they're direct tax benefits as well. Uh, Vikrant just flagged me whenever I have only five minutes to go because this could actually take much longer. <laughs> yeah. The other element um, of an acquisition, and I'm just going to, going to touch a few aspects of what, what you encounter in an M&A deal, is sometimes, and what we were just discussing, is I buy the full restaurant, I buy the full restaurant chain. But sometimes I may not buy the full restaurant chain, I may just buy majority ownership. So again, it is, there is an acquisition, but I'm not doing a 100% buyout, I'm just doing majority stake. In which case, as a lawyer, I also need to think in terms of if you therefore have the seller is also a partner in your ongoing business, once you have bought majority ownership, then you need some sort of partnership or joint venture arrangement that allows the two of you to work together. It sells, sets the rules for the two of you to work together to take the business forward. So as a lawyer, that is another form of M&A that happens, which is where you where you, where you, when you buy, you're keeping an eye on this needs to run as a partnership in the future, and how do I work with these guys in the future? So somewhat like in the, in the more recent sort of flip, Flipkart Walmart deal, you would have seen in the news that Walmart is looking to buy 75 or 80 percent, which means that there are some existing shareholders that are still going to sit in Flipkart, and so therefore Walmart has to figure out how they're going to actually work with those guys who's still sitting in the company. Um, in, 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 in terms of the asset sale, where, where it is not a purchase of the shares of the company, one way, there are a couple of ways to do an asset sale. One is, as I described, it's a slump price. So there's a consolidated price for the entire business that I buy. It includes assets and liabilities. And you have a single slump price. And there are various tax benefits to doing the deal in this particular manner. But sometimes what happens is because I'm buying assets and liabilities, the liabilities could be very, very high. And they might be liabilities that I do not want to deal with having bought the company. So what I do is I say, look, I don't want to take over the liabilities. I only want to buy our assets. So how do we do it? Because then a slump price is not possible. And so therefore, there is a need to allocate prices to different parts of the business. So if there is a real asset, real estate, then this is the value of the real estate. If there's intellectual property, this is the value of the intellectual property. If there's a customer base, then I'm selling my customer base at this price. There's a workforce, I sell it at this price. And so you actually break up the, the single price that otherwise would have happened into components. You call that an itemized sale. Uh, so it is still a takeover of a business, but you can actually do it in terms of allocating different values to different parts of the business. Uh, An itemized sale, the benefit is that you can get rid of liabilities, as we were just discuss uh, discussing, but it is not as tax efficient as, say, a slump sale is. So the tax liabilities tend to become a little larger. Now some of the, when, when, when I sort of became a corporate lawyer, some of the new things that I encountered, which actually I did not encounter as a litigator, is the idea of either market practice or market standards. So very often I would approach a certain situation and the lawyers around the table or the other side would say, no, this is the way to do it because this is market standard. So I would say, what market standard? I want to do it differently this time, so why should I follow what you... Just because there's a market standard doesn't mean that I'm legally bound to do it. So I actually want to deviate from the market standard. Used to be my approach. And then slowly there was realization as to why market standard is relevant, and therefore you tend to pick the situations in which you want to deviate from market standard. 
one of the things that market standard does is when you buy a company very often it's not just buying the company they are regulatory approvals that you need to get they are tax situations you need to deal with uh, they are third party vendors that you need to deal with so when you buy the a business there are various other third entities that you need to deal with now when you do a buy of a business which is what they are used to in their mind it is easier the third parties that you interact with so when you buy a business you actually want to run it without interruption you want it to be a smooth business uh, going forward so you need to get the third parties also comfortable with what need what is happening over here very often it is more regulatory in in in, in its perspective uh, so to get the regulators and third parties comfortable you will tend to say that let me go with a market practice because that is the easiest way to implement a deal if i try to be innovative and it may be legally valid and my point was always that if it is legally valid why should i accept market practice the thing is that the regulator if you come up with something new that the regulator let's say it is the rbi or it is uh, a tax authority if it is something new that they are not used to seeing they tend to jump up from their seats because typically bureaucrats regardless of what they think of themselves really don't understand everything in the world it could include a regulator like the sebi so if you are in a listed company situation the sebi also may have a reaction to how you are doing something which is where following the market practice is helpful there is a there is a another element is when you buy a business and in india there are not so many situations where you can actually do it but you need not necessarily use your own money you can borrow money to buy a business and world over that's what happens in certain situations in india you can actually do borrowings to buy a business so if you are doing a buying of a business in terms of market standard the lender is also comfortable giving you because he's seen various other transactions happen in that sense and for him the risks are clearly identified so to get a loan to buy a business from a bank it is better to do it in terms of what the banks have normally seen rather than a new way of buying a business in which case they need to evaluate what the risks are and it becomes more time consuming so that was market practice the other uh, one other element that i actually noticed was valuation adjustment so one of the things i mean think of it in terms of you go to buy a house so the seller of the house says that i'll sell my house for a crore you say no actually it should only cost 50 lakhs the two of you have different valuations when you're buying a business as against a house a business is very often bought on a projection for profitability in the future because the only reason for my, me to buy a business is very often not to buy the asset it is to buy the profitability going forward in the future so how do i value the profitability looking at your books of accounts from the last few years how do i make sure that in the next 5 years if i buy your business for 100 rupees that i will get it because my options are if i have 100 rupees to invest i can in, i can put it in a savings account it will give me 4% i can invest it in the stock market or a mutual fund it will give me x% or if i buy your business then actually should it give me more and therefore i need to take a call as a buyer looking at your profitability from the past is that is this a better place for me to invest in do will i make a better return by investing which basically means that you need to look into the future and this is called valuation this is how businesses are valued very often so there were many forms of valuing uh, businesses but the most common one is to look at future profitability or future projections the more i use the term profit but the more fancy name these days which is jargon in my mind they use the term called ebita so ebita is nothing but it's a earning before tax appreciation uh, just think in terms of profit this is the profit uh, revenue before or earnings before depreciation tax etc and so from from your perspective think ebita in terms of profit so that's how you would actually calculate uh, valuation so you would see in the news that this is at x times ebita it just means that x times annual profit of this company thinking in layman terms simple terms valuation adjustment then became an interesting aspect of when you do an acquisition because if i believe that 50 lakhs is the price 
and somebody else believes that one crore is a price, the two ways of doing it is either we can agree to a mutually acceptable price and that is the deal and the deal is done on that basis. The other way to do it is that I will say, look, from 50 I'm willing to go up to 70. You are with, the seller is willing to drop down to 90, so there's still a 20 gap. And the seller is telling you that, look, I believe that 90 is the correct value because in the next 10 years, it is going to make so much profit. So the deal could also be that, okay, I will give you 70 now. The remaining 20, I will give you after a period of X when the business actually demonstrates that it has made so much profit. So then there is a valuation adjustment mechanism that an m &A lawyer would do. It sort of in the documentation and you look at the laws that surround this is how do I pay 70 today to be able to track the profits and then make the remaining 20% uh, or 20 rupees payment. So that is just valuation adjustment and that's the other big thing that I encountered when I became an m &A lawyer is very often there's a gap between buyer and seller and if you still want to close the deal then how do you do it and how do you make the valuation adjustment. Different from what you, what you very often encounter as a disputes lawyer, one of the things that a commercial lawyer encounters is the clients burning, and you have to think of the client not in terms of the normal clients that you deal with. These are professional managers. They have bosses, and the bosses have shareholders on top of them. So their, every decision of theirs gets questioned. There is also pressure on them to actually do deals because, uh, because your bosses are getting bonuses, you are getting bonuses, shareholders are getting dividends. So unless you do deals, the profitability of the business is not going to grow. And so therefore, the people that you encounter are constantly wanting to do deals rather than to allow for deals to fail. And my old approach as a lawyer used to be that I will look at your deal and I will tell you what is not going to work in law. Now that approach does not work in an m &A deal because here the guys want to do, your clients want to do a deal. So if they come to you with something and if you're going to shoot down for A, B or C reasons, they are not going to be happy. So the more the preferred route, really, as lots of us have learned over a period of time, is to say that, all right, these are roadblocks to a deal, but how am I going to go around the roadblock and still get the deal done? So I'm going to use a legal approach, So what, and that is called structuring the deal. Is that in a straightforward manner, if something can't get done, then how do you actually structure around the obstacle? And you, in a legal manner, so there is nothing illegal about it, but legally, how do you structure around a deal and how do you get the deal done? So that's the other pressure that you sort of face from clients uh, uh, very often. So when you approach a commercial situation, your client is not happy for you to be saying that, oh, this is legal, that is not legal, this is not legal, you can't do this. They do not hear that. Basically, a commercial guy wants to go back to his bosses and say two things. One, I have done the deal, and two, it is legal. He wants a certificate from his lawyer saying that it is legal, so therefore, how to make the deal that I want to do as a legal deal is your problem. Don't ask me for decisions. You make the decisions, you tell me this is how you want to do it. So it is radically a different form of practice as you sort of encounter it as, uh, as, as lawyers. I don't know if you have a lot of time, should I? Okay. <laughs> so there are three or four key elements when you look at uh, doing an M&A deal and I'll sort of rush through this because we probably have another few minutes, two, three minutes left. Um, there is something called a legal due diligence and the purpose of a legal due diligence is actually you look at the books of the company, you look at the contracts of the company. The purpose is to identify other reasons why this deal cannot be done. So despite what I said about structuring around legal issues, are there some legal issues that are so big that this cannot be done? Is the first thing that you have to identify. Second thing, there will be many small things that will be obstacles around legal issues. And you need to, you need to have work around it. So you say, all right, yeah, if I sign the document to buy your business on this day, and we will close the, the I'll actually buy the business on another day, the period in between the two dates is where I want you to do A, B, C, D to remove these obstacles. That is called conditions precedent. So there are a few set of conditions precedent that you would typically identify in a due diligence 
which you write into your document saying that from signing to closing these are things that you will actually do and if you do them then I will buy otherwise I will not buy the one other thing that you actually do in a due diligence is to identify what is called so in a due diligence what happens is a seller opens his books of record shows his contracts and basically discloses all business information to you what you don't know is if the disclosure is full or it is not full the standard is I will look at the I will do a due diligence I look at your books but I will write my acquisition document as if I don't know anything so it that is meant to take care of a situation where a seller has hidden some vital information and you do encounter it as m a lawyers as do a whole lot of diligence partly on the base of what client has what the seller has given you partly on account of what is available in the public realm but you do encounter from time to time sort of hidden gems so to say uh, hidden poison pills they come to bite you subsequently so you have not identified it and so therefore to deal with those situations you have to write a purchase contract with very very strong representations warranties and indemnities to actually cover those so the purpose of the due diligence is also to identify what are the reps and warranties that I want to get and what are the things that I want indemnities on so indemnities is if I lose X amount of money then you will actually pay me back so I paid you 100 but actually because of this liability the value should have been 97 so you give me three back so that's what an indemnity is meant to do and and you do the due diligence to actually identify things like that you then do transaction structuring so once you have understood what the deal is about you figure out you I mean very often what I tend to do and different people do differently I actually write it on a board so I draw boxes and circles and I say all right this is going this way this is going this way and look at it and think in terms of what are the regulatory issues what are the tax issues what are the commercial issues and then identify are there changes that we need to do from what is being proposed do we need to do it slightly differently are there ways to make it more efficient and you then that's how you sort of do transaction structuring and the host of things and if any of you are specifically interested I'll be happy to chat about you on a one-on-one -on -one. You will then incorporate what you have got from your diligence and your transaction structuring into the documentation. The, the one critical component after having done that is just negotiation. And very often there are many approaches as you would say to negotiation. When I, used, when I just come out of being a litigating lawyer, I used to actually be a very hard negotiator. So I used to catch some points and I used to hammer at each one of them very very strongly and I wouldn't allow the deal to progress unless you gave me what I wanted what I realized over a period of time is that there are let's say there are 10 issues that exist five of them are very important for your client and for you the other five are not as important they are important but not as important but they are probably more important for the seller so in a negotiation how do you do it do you go hard at all 10 or do I go extremely hard for the five and if the five are not met I'm happy for the deal to collapse but for the other five if I don't get them I'm willing to concede space so I'm willing to actually give up on three points if I can get two more um, so on those five I would use sort of the Hindi phrase bhakti var chor ki langoti sahi so you grab whatever you can uh, but don't actually let the deal die because those five are not met that's the sort of so various ways of doing negotiations but a win-win approach is typically the better way to get the job done and from the client's perspective as I said really most clients don't care a damn about how good or not you are as a lawyer they want to get the deal done and they want to actually tell their bosses that we have done a successful deal and business has expanded so lawyering is not the most prominent thing in their mind they just want to be sure that there is no additional untold liability that follows them when it when they do the deal so really that's the approach that you bring even to negotiations is that how do I do the deal because there is greater value in doing a deal than in killing a deal so you actually tend to lean in favor of doing the deal and the last element is how do you actually close so having signed the contract as I said there is a period between signing and when you actually purchase the business and how do you close and what what are the things that you need to do in terms of closing and that very often is very tricky because 
when you buy a business, often you want to business to be a going concern. So you want it to be uninterrupted. If you are manufacturing something, you don't want manufacturing to stop even for a day. You want manufacturing to continue. If you are running a, if you are buying a restaurant, you don't want the restaurant to shut down even for a day. You want it to actually be continuing to do business. So really, that transition period, you then have to figure out what are the things that you need to do so that the business can sort of function smoothly. Uh, there's a change in ownership, but the customers and the vendors are not disturbed by what has happened. And that sort of increases market confidence. So, but that, Vikrant, I don't know if is good enough. I thought that's a, just a quick snapshot to just demystify. Yes. Yes. One question. I will just ask you and to have learned it from you. Uh, with regard to acquisition and merger, we have already just come through. Main thing, is, uh, main thing is that, that suppose if while just acquiring or with regard to the acquisition, I have taken the asset of your company. But what about the liabilities? How I will deal with that one? With regard to assets, there is no problem. I acquired your asset. But if so many liabilities must be there, how I will just uh, deal with that liability with regard to the mergers, this much I want to know it. So answer to that, sir, mm. thank you. Um, answer to that is, is one, you do a due diligence to get a sense for what the liabilities are. Now, due diligence, as I said, is capable of being done in various ways. But sometimes you might actually not find a liability. There may be hidden liability or a hidden sort of poison somewhere lying over there. So where you identify the liability is fairly easy because you can commercially negotiate that this is the, this is the cost of the liability, reduce the price, and I'll take over the liability. If you are doing an asset purchase and you are doing an itemized sale, you also have the option of saying, I am not going to buy these liabilities. So I am going to buy in an asset purchase, you can also say that I am going to buy only identified liabilities. So unidentified liabilities are left behind. But that doesn't work when you buy shares of a company, because when you buy shares of a company, then there is no exclusion of liabilities, then all liabilities are just sitting in the company. That is where a combination of the due diligence which is both what the seller gives you as well as what you obtain from the public space in combination with the reps and warranties and indemnities that you get. And sometimes you might actually create escrows. So you might say, all right, I have to give you 100. I'm giving you 80, 20 is lying in an escrow account. So if this liability fructifies in the next two years, then I am not going to ask you for the money. I'm going to actually pull it out of the escrow directly. So various ways of dealing with liabilities. Uh, I think there's some interesting event happening behind, but <laughs> but that that by and large is how you deal with a liability uh, in, in an acquisition situation. Yeah, there was. Excuse me. So when you when you structure a deal first, you understand what you're buying. So just the business itself. You then say, if I'm going to actually buy this business, these are the regulatory issues that are going to come. So I need these licenses. These leases need to transfer. These are bank loans. Have I, does, does the seller have to actually end the bank loan? Does he have to pay off earlier, not pay off? If you are a cross-border deal, so that's just in India. Let's, let's say you're a foreigner buying an Indian company, or an Indian company going out to buy a foreign company, then you have to also look at foreign exchange issues. And in India, foreign exchange issues are a bit uh, in your face. So actually, you can't avoid them. You actually need to take them into account when you structure deals. You also need to then think in terms of tax implications. Because if you do something in one manner, it could have a certain high tax consequence. But if you do it slightly differently, it could lower the tax consequence. There is also the need for deal certainty. So what happens is, think of it both from a buyer and a seller perspective. And that's what you think in terms of structuring. Is that if I sign an agreement as a seller, if I sign an agreement to sell, the, you will typically inform the market 
that I am now selling. So if it's a large company, you will make a press release or there will be people that will come to know that even if you're a small business that you're selling the business. The impact is immediate. Your workforce becomes uncertain about what is going to happen to them. So they're demotivated. Your vendors, people who are supplying you uh, either materials or providing you services, they become uncertain as to, they, yes, they have dealt with you for so many years, they're comfortable with you, but what about the new guy? Am I going to be? So when you sign a deal, as a seller, you want to be sure that when I sign the deal, the deal will close. Because if the deal doesn't close, then suddenly I've created big disruption in my business. And actually the value has gone down. Then I need to work hard to actually bring it back to the same level. So in structuring a deal, you also need to think in terms of how am I going to close the deal. Whereas if you're an acquirer, and there, that's where the push and pull is, if you're the acquirer, you are going to do a due diligence and you're going to do, there may be approvals that you need to get. You're also going to think in terms of if all this doesn't happen, can I walk away from this deal smoothly? So for you always, until the time you buy, you want to have the right to walk away from the purchase. So that's the other element that actually coming from different directions, depending upon who you are representing, those are the elements uh, that you will think in terms of. And in addition to that, there's just a very large list of things that we can chat about separately. <laughs> yeah, for, for India, a landmark acquisition took place when an uh, Indian company acquired a British company, Tetley. Tata acquired Tetley. What are the essentials required as far as the Indian legal system is concerned for acquiring a foreign company, then what, what are the essentials required as far as the legal system is concerned? So from an Indian law perspective, primarily, you're looking at foreign exchange regulation because Indian laws are not in play when Tata actually goes and buys a company in the UK. Largely regulated by UK law because that's where the target is. But from an Indian perspective, if you remember some years back, it was Imp even if you traveled overseas, there was a limitation on how much money you could take out of India in the, in the FERA days. And the FEMA made it easier. But since then, increasingly, the RBI has made it easier for companies to take larger amounts of money and invest or buy businesses overseas. So there is an RBI regulation on overseas investment. That's the regulation that you use for acquisition. So it, it, it primarily depends on net asset value. So what is your asset value over here? How much money can you actually take out and deploy over there? That's the Indian regulatory element. But one of the interesting elements, and as I was describing, it doesn't happen so much in India. Almost every acquisition that an Indian company dad, does overseas, there is a big financing element to it. So they, you don't, if, if, the, if you're going to buy something for 100 rupees, you actually don't deploy all 100 is not yours. You deploy 25, 75 you take as loans from banks overseas. So there are elements, so when you create security, once you're, uh, the international bank may want security, and the security only in terms of the target may not be good enough. They may want guarantees from you. So the other element of Indian law is when do you give security that are Indian security. So if you're going to write a guarantee, then what, what can you pay under there? Or if you're going to create other securities on Indian assets, then how are you going to create those securities? So those are the sort of Indian elements. Like these are uh, commercial aspects of mergers and acquisitions. Like you said that we go to the court for mergers and acquisitions. What are the provisions under which we go? What sort of petitions is, are filed? What are the court fees? And what is the tribunal or high court or NCLT we have to go? So I can, I can give you references of the old Companies Act. I think in the new Companies Act it is 200 and something, but earlier it used to be 391 to 394 uh, under the 1956 Act. I think it is 233 or some, some, some number like that. Uh, but that's just a question of looking at where it is. So this is applicable to mergers. Uh, I have thankfully uh, had the ability to stay away from what court fees are paid because there are lots of other people who very quickly figure that out and do it. But, but it's really, uh, that's the simpler element of what you encounter uh, in an m &A deal. So one way to think of it, see very often the, how the clients describe it. The clients say, look, the law is written in the books and today your client is not a lay person. Very often your client is an in-house counsel, is a lawyer himself 
for some years has practiced law and then gone and joined a company. The client will tell you that, look, I, know, I also know how to pick a law book. Today, very questions, you can just Google it. So it's not 20 years back. You Google a question, you get a basic answer. So a client is going to tell you that I, I can also figure out what laws are applicable. I can actually go there, various sites that will tell you what all regulations are there, what code fees are there, what processes are there. I just need to Google it and I'll get it. What I need from you is strategic advice. How should I do it? So what techniques do I do? How do I speak? How do I negotiate? How do I structure a deal? That is where your input is. So very often, most people don't spend so much time thinking in terms of just the documentation because there is enough to be done in terms of documentation. The true value in acquisition is in terms of how do you do the bigger piece and then the rest is sort of, so to say, to use the term cookie cutter, so it's easily implemented. But the easy way to look at it is company code rules. Uh, One second. Um, how do you see this uh, Satyam as well as uh, Global Trust Bank merger? Um, what kind of challenges as an advocate we have to see in those kind of uh, uh, mergers? Since those are, you, you are aware, those are the scam kind of uh, events happen. So I, I am not, I, I don't claim to know any specifics of the Satyam uh, merger. But essentially, it will be the liabilities that we were just discussing. Because are there old liabilities that are going to flow through to the, to the buyer? And how is the buyer actually going to stay away from any of the old liabilities? So some liabilities have been dealt with when Satyam itself was restructured. Um, but really, it is how do you deal with those liabilities? Are there claims of frauds that somebody else is going to bring to you? And therefore, as a lawyer, I would say my instinct, and I don't know how, the, how this particular deal is structured, my instinct would be to say if everything else is equal, then just do it as an asset purchase. Because then I can leave back uh, un undisclosed, uh, un uninformed liabilities. The answer lies in terms of what is the business that you're buying. So if you feel that there is a big risk in terms of untold liabilities, then an asset purchase is better. If you feel that you understand the company well, then a share purchase will also work. If it is a listed company and you're buying the entire company, you're buying majority stake, very often you have to go with, I mean, in the Indian context, some of this can change, but anything that is price sensitive under SEBI regulations required to be disclosed to the stock exchange. And then there is a valuation adjustment that happens in the market price once you make the disclosure. If it is a listed company, there is a greater degree of comfort that all untold liabilities are also in the public realm. So when you're buying a listed company, you actually look at what all has been disclosed what is it that the public is aware of because there is an obligation to have disclosed uh, price sensitive information. So it will depend, uh, depends on what kind of business you're buying, what company you're buying, is it a very old company, is it a conglomerate, is it somebody that is an unknown person that you're buying from, so it will all depend on that. So you see what? You typically see commercials redacted in most of these agreements when you go in for a due diligence. How does one really arrive at the true value of the offer that you make to buy a private corporation? So what happens is that in the contract you will see the commercial redacted. But all commercials will in some manner be reflected in the balance sheets. And so when you do valuations, it is primarily not based on the legal diligence, it is based on the financial or the commercial diligence, because the balance sheet will show all the numbers, unless something has been hidden away and tucked away. But that's more in terms of liability. The revenue, everybody actually wants to exaggerate. So very often it would be there, balance sheets would have been audited. So you have to take some comfort over there. And if it remains redacted, make sure that the redaction goes away because between signing and closing, you're going to insist that I actually want to see what is there because now I'm committed contractually. I want to see this is what you have told me this number is. I want to make sure that this number is true. 
and one of your CPs or one of your walkaways from the deal is if what you told me and what I see is different, I have the right to walk away. So contingent liability, you're saying how is contingent liability weighed in in terms of valuation? So think of it like this, there is no, I mean I'm not a valuation expert but as I understand it, think of it in terms of a listed company. So in a listed company you actually, a balance sheet will show contingent liabilities. The market values it and there is a share price arrived at because it takes into account the contingent liability. Their different, see valuation is a very tricky thing. I'm not a huge fan of the manner in which valuations are done or future projections are done. I'm also not a big fan of the manner in which contingent liabilities are, uh, are assessed in terms of overall valuation. So I don't have a clear answer to give you in terms of how do you factor in because this is really a question that you sh is for an expert valuer. But when you look at the balance sheet, you will know that ABC is a contingent liability. So when you write the agreement, you'll actually write it that there should be no other liabilities. Any other liabilities that come, you either indemnify me. At times, contingent liability may have to be paid or may not have to be paid, depending what happens in future. But the tricky part would be the pricing of the deal because the contingency liabilities are already appearing in the balance sheet as a footnote. So different people, so there are two ways. There are gut feel buyers who will, who will look at a contingent liability and give whatever weightage they want to, uh, to give to a contingent liability and buy at that price. So there will always be a discounting. When there is contingent liability, there will be a discount. The question is what should be the level of discount? If they are sophisticated buyers, then they will be valuers who have got standard set mechanisms to actually look at contingent liability and, and apply discounting factors. So that's typically the way it would be done. How it is exactly done is a question for a valuer. Yeah, well. may, may I have just last? I, should, I think I should be having a last question. Actually, uh, when you were saying in, in the mid of your lecture, that uh, uh, in case sale is a sale of a company is not being finalized, then you can see how uh, uh, how we will see a turn around, and we will see that uh, sale is finalized. What is the meaning of turn around? How this factor is uh, factor comes into light in this respect? Not turn around, downturn. I would say. So, okay, okay so, downturn. So what happens is that let's say that you have a business that you have built over twenty years. So when you build a business over 20 years, who are the people, your business actually exists because many people are reposing confidence in you. Now who are those people who are reposing confidence in you? Your customers, people who are suppliers or vendors, your workers, your workforce, these are typically people who are reposing confidence in you. When you say that now I've set up a business for 20 years and I'm selling out, so I'm getting out of it, all of these have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you as the manager for the business. They are all worried about what is going to happen. So very often you will find, and this particularly happens in large companies, is that your senior and mid-level management will start looking for new jobs and they will move away. And there is value attributed to what a good trained workforce can do for you. A loyal workforce of people that have been working with you for a long time, there is value that they actually bring to the business. So if those people leave, or if your vendors decide that they no longer want to give you credit, because the credit, if they give you, extend your credit, then the next guy has to pay it. And they are not sure whether the next guy will pay it or not. So they will actually reduce giving you credit. What all of this hap does is it actually reduces your business volume. Your profitability goes down and that's the bit of downturn that happens. So when you do M&A, a lot of thought is given to how do I make sure that this downturn does not happen. So it's not the legal part, but there is a lot of HR uh, and, and commercial presentations that are made to vendors, that are made to employees to make sure that they are comfortable, that they don't leave and so that the business is, doesn't go, uh, because see, even for a buyer, if the business goes down, then it's not good for the buyer as well. So there is a huge focus on how do you make sure that the business doesn't lose value, 
and what is it that you will do which is not legal but what other things will you do to make sure that this business is going as it is expected to anand um it's nice to see you in black and white um one of the things which has an overlap between corporate lawyers and litigators is what happens when a deal goes south and one of the big deals that went south was daichi saikyo and uh, <clears throat> ran back sees the acquisition uh, many of us don't have uh, access to the arbitration award so we don't know exactly where the facts went and perhaps you have had a chance to see it but i'd like your comments if you know what happened in that and what kind of steps should be taken not only by corporate lawyers who do the drafting but also litigators in terms of what they should avoid in the arbitration so that such an award never happens again for their client thanks so i i can safely say that i actually don't know the deal in any amount of detail other than what i've gathered to the news um but as i understand it essentially there was a claim for either misrepresentation or fraud by the sellers and so this is common i mean that's what as an acquirer lawyer you actually look at is that how do i ring fence against fraud or misrepresentation and in this particular case as i understand it there was an international arbitration uh, agreement and there was international arbitration uh, they were able to establish by way of evidence that either fraud or misrepresentation took place and therefore the value that had been obtained from the acquirer was higher than it actually ought to have been i.e if there was full disclosure then i would not have paid you how much i paid you and therefore there should be a return of that i don't know if there were penalties involved or not but in terms of let's say that you are representing a not very honest seller and that is where you need to start thinking in terms of how am i going to avoid liability that somebody will somebody who is overpaid will want to reclaim from me so really it is in terms of how do you control the representations that you give so how do you write your representation then that is why in lot of mna deals hard fights over the language in the reps and warranties so you really if if you have a sense for where this is going or this is a likely possibility and your client will tell you that look this i am uncomfortable with without being fully honest you have to figure out a way how do you appear to be honest but actually write your rep and warranty in a manner that you basically keep your client out of the loop uh getting out of arbitration is not really where the trick is the trick really is in how do you do your reps warranties and how do you sunset your reps warranties and indemnities so the other trick that you would use as a seller lawyer is you will say there is a liability x but the buyer will not know of liability x before 2 years so you will get to know but it will be after 2 years or after 18 months so i will say okay i'll give you this rep and warranty but these reps and warranties will sunset in 18 months and so therefore and if somebody says why should they sunset i'll say look business is in your hand you run around and find out if there is any liability if there is one you make a claim on me otherwise this is the end so once you have taken over the business my argument will be now it is your job to figure out what is there so that i don't know if that fully answers uh, the question thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> very informative lecture by mr anand prasad and uh, respected uh, senior advocates and respected members of the bar we are all very thankful to all of you to have attended this uh, lecture and making it a success thank you very much